it shows that face it is going to Facebook Mosaic America. It is live on YouTube Mosaic Silicon Valley. Can somebody check San Jose Museum of Art uh, YouTube real quick if you're getting it? I see us on the Mosaic page and I will go check the San Jose Museum of Arts YouTube. Okay, thank you, listen. I see some of you have already joined us. We're gonna give a couple more minutes for more of our audience to join. And then we'll have Robin from the museum welcome us all officially. Hey, sir. <laughs> okay. Hi back, Prakriti. If you're just joining us, we're gonna give the um, rest of us a couple more minutes to join. We are right at six o'clock. We'll probably begin in a minute. All right, Robin, it's uh, 6.01, and we have healthy participation from the audience in terms of numbers. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Priya. Um, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. It's still light out, so I guess it's afternoon, right? Good evening, everybody. My name is Robin Treen, and I work at the San Jose Museum of Art. And this is our regular, uh, th one of our regular Third Thursday series programs uh, tonight, which we are hosting in conjunction with our good friends at Mosaic Silicon Valley. And uh, this program is being held in celebration of Women's History Month, which this is. And um, I think it is important tonight to note um, that for this particular uh, Women's History Month this year, March 2021, um, it's sort of bookended by a couple of um, very noteworthy events. On the one hand, uh, the 2020 election left us with the highest representation in Congress by women that we have ever had, which we are now up to a whopping 27% women representing us in Congress, which considering that we're 52% of the population, <laughs> I think we have a little room left to grow. Um, and then the other um, thing I think sort of uh, we're offering this program also, I want to just um, acknowledge in the shadow of another mass shooting in, in the United States, um, one that uh, had nine victims, eight of whom were killed, uh, seven of those eight were women and six of those seven were Asian women. And so I do want to acknowledge um, that event and again, another act of misogyny, but also the intersectionality of that as well, because it seems really important to acknowledge that right now. So I do want to just um, acknowledge those victims as well. So um, anyway, um, that's it. So again, I, we're very pleased to be working with our good friends, Mosaic Silicon Valley tonight. And I think we have a really um, interesting lineup of programming um, by, for, and about women tonight. So I will turn it over to my good friend Priya Das at Mosaic Silicon Valley. And it's my pleasure to introduce her and take it away, Priya. All right, Robin, um, we are actually very happy that the music has, um, music, museum, the museum has finally opened up. Yes, you we want have. To kind of announce that again? Oh, yes, I did want to announce that. I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, the museum has reopened 
on a very limited basis. So we've reopened within both the CDC and the Santa Clara County Health Guidelines. Um, and we're, so we're open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You can check the website for hours and for ticketing and to see what's on view. So for those of you who, after a year of pandemic, are climbing the walls, <laughs> I'm sure there's some people who are just ready to lose it. Um, the museum actually offers a really wonderful, safe, contemplative place to go and have a nice cultural experience that's not at home and not staring at your own four walls. So yes, please do come and visit us and, and take advantage of this opportunity. And thanks for reminding me, Priya. Oh, absolutely. We love, like, like we've always said, the museum is like a second home to uh, Mosaic Silicon Valley. You've opened your arms wide um, for us uh, at every juncture and we love it. As, um, and then, you know, you've, you've, you've had so many programs with us like, the, like today. So I, I just just 30 seconds about why uh, we are calling this show then is still now. Um, the reason is simple. It's because what plagues uh, humankind and womankind today uh, is no different from what used to happen many years ago, centuries ago, right? And so we always continually need uh, women uh, who are rising up and standing up and having inspirational voices that we can follow. Um, so we, Mosaic, you know, America wanted to put a path forward, right? Where do we go from here? We want to always connect uh, different people, different arts and create conversations so that we all have a path forward collaboratively and co-creatively, right? And so today, we have, uh, you know, our beautiful artists, four artists here, uh, and culture bearers, who will basically show us what they have been doing, how they have been standing up, for what are they standing up, for whom are they standing up. Uh, and we will also attempt to connect all these conversations to place, be it San Jose, California, or America. Uh, we are also going to connect people to groups individuals to people and organizations. So you, I am definitely having such a great time introducing all our panelists. Um, let's start with um, Charlene Vasquez and Justina Palafox, who will um, represent our native brothers and sisters here today, our Ohlone um, and native uh, people and uh, Charlene is the um, chairperson at the Confederation of Ololi People. Justina is her daughter, and we'll hear more from them a little later. Uh, then we have Latoya Fernandez, uh, who is an activist, a multi-talented <laughs> artist, and an educator in this uh, San Jose local area. And then uh, we have Shikha Malavia, who is a spoken word artist that Mosaic has presented several times. Um, what I would like to do now is to actually begin the program with uh, Charlene and Justina. And uh, may I please ask the others to get off video as I myself will. Uh, Charlene, um, you wanted us wanted to share a video. Could you tell us a little bit about what that video is about and why you wanted to share it and why you created it in the first place? Sure. So, Charlene, could you come back on video? Here we go. I said, Sorry. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I will say that for the for many years now, and it's just not myself and, and my daughter, but many Ohlone people are um, con concerned about land issues and sacred sites and the protection of them, and the only way to get people to understand why it's so important is if we take them to those places and talk about those places. And it turns out that art is a great vehicle for creating awareness. Um, to that end, we have photography that reaches way back in our family lineage. My grandfather, who was born in 1917, sorry, 1915, <laughs> was a professional photographer and actually had a studio in downtown San Jose. And because of that, photography has kind of run through our blood. And then uh, my grandmother, she has been sewing forever. And I started sewing with her when I was about four or five years old. 
um, not sewing by hand, but on her machine. So I learned how to sew on her machine. So we created this video to kind of talk about the importance of culture and tradition and legacy and how that will help us to uh, preserve um, culture, but also to share um, information and a message to the community. Justina, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, I think the video, uh, when we were making the video and you're taking the pictures, um, it's a whole different feeling. And then when you see the video, it's kind of, um, uh, it's just something you can keep and something you can show your family um, later on. I think the images are very powerful and and it's kind of like, is that us? Was that really us standing there? It, I, I just love the images and I think each image just holds a story just by itself. All right, so let us, let me attempt to start this video. Give me a moment. My name is Charlene Eigen Vasquez, and I'm a descendant of the Ohlone people, um, right from Chautauqua down to Carmel. My name is Justina Palafox. I am the daughter of Charlene Eigen, and I'm also a descendant of the Ohlone people. Today, we spent some time making ribbon skirts. And essentially, we did this for a couple of different things. Usually, uh, Ohlone people, when they're dancing or when they're in ceremony, they'll often wear grass skirts, which we have our own grass skirts. The significance of the long skirt, it's not necessarily a form of modesty, but it's a form of um, respect to the creator. And it's a reminder that we're grounded and that we're connected to Mother Earth. And so we really want our skirts to be all the way down to our ankles to remind us of that connection to Mother Earth and to remind us to be humble and honorable. Recently, like many people or many women in a number of different countries, we've decided to go ahead, at least have decided to go ahead and add ribbon to our skirts. And the ribbons today and for us signifies um, the remembrance of missing and murdered indigenous women. After we made the ribbon skirts, we decided to go to Mission San Juan Batista and um, we went over there and you know, every time I go to a mission, um, I get this wave of emotion and it's as soon as you step out of the car, um, it's just because I believe because just all the ancestors that were there and, and what they went through. And it's kind of interesting because I look around and I see everybody else who's visiting other tourists. And I think to myself, are they feeling what I'm feeling? Can they feel it from the ground all the way up to your heart? Um, and the power of, of the people that live there, you know? And, and I watch my, my children and they're walking around and they're looking at the walls and, and I let them feel what they feel. I don't tell them how I'm feeling and I don't, I, I want them to get their own feelings. And of course I share the history and I share what what really happened and what really happened to our people and how the culture was stripped away and families were separated and and we kind of just walk around and and i think about you know if walls can talk and what happened exactly where i'm standing and and do people when they visit do they think about that and i can and i will continue to take my children to the missions just so they don't forget and we pay our respects for the people that were just trying to live daily there. I would agree with that. And I think it's kind of an interesting perspective because as we were walking around with our skirts and we were um, 
you know, taking some pictures. There were a few tourists that were kind of looking around and looking at us and probably trying to figure out what we were doing. And, and, and from a distance, I can hear them saying things like, oh, look at those pretty skirts or really nice things. And not re they had no idea what was going on. And that's totally fine, except for it's just a reminder of how many people know what really happened at the missions? How many people really know the suffering that took place? In order to understand even the images, the photographs that were taken, you know, there's there's a photo of us near standing near a cross, for example, at least when we're at the mission. I imagine what people thought. What did the Ohlone people think when they were there? What about the people that escaped? What about the people at the other missions who re revolted? What was it like for them? It, it's a really hard place to be, but it's a place that, as Justina mentioned, is really important to go and visit and remind yourself of that history every now and then. What is it that stands out to you and makes you um, feel good about what happened? It was a very hands-on. So my daughters are there picking out the ribbon, picking out their fabric, watching us sew and even if they're ironing fabric they're sitting in the circle with us they're watching our hands they're listening to us laugh at the same time we're making a beautiful skirt for for each and every one sitting at the table we're keeping the traditions and when we made these skirts it, hardly anything was written down i repeated base i literally repeated what we did from step one to the very end over and that's how I remembered it. And then we um, got to wear the skirts that we made today and then went to go to the mission. And um, it was just, it was a beautiful process to start with just fabric and then ending and ending in a way with our ancestors and showing respect to the people that came before us. All right, Charlene and Justina, let me welcome you back on video. You know, when I saw this video, it reminded me of my uh, visit to the Santa Cruz mission. And uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm feeling overcome a bit because for me, it was my daughter who was 10 years old. It was a school project and uh, so it was a tradition, it was a mother-daughter tradition, right? And then when we went to the mission and there were these dark historical facts and there were some pictures and I was like, I was just, I just couldn't even comprehend the scale of, of the annihilation that went on, right? And I said, I'm here with my daughter and, and here is destruction of so many generations, right? But then I remember thinking, what do I do with this emotion that I'm feeling, right? Who do I reach out to? Is there any action that I can take? Which is why, you know, and you know, as part of our mission at Mosaic 2, we're constantly thinking about how do we connect, you know, people to history, people to our future? How do we together create a sense of a shared future? And I just wanted to kind of, you know, Charlene, you had said something about how do we move forward from here and how everybody has to be inquisitive in their own way. Could you talk to us a little bit about how you can help, how the rest of us can stand up with you? So one of the things that I think about is that we really are kind of limited in the ways that, um, Justine, are you tearing? <laughs> it really is a hard thing. But what I was going to say is that um, the way that the visibility that there is for the Ohlone people, I would say, especially in the South Bay, is pretty limited. So Usha and Priya, who's not on camera right now, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for opening that door. Um, you know, it's one thing to go out and speak in front of, you know, uh, county supervisors or, uh, you know, a city board to talk about, you know, please don't dig up another ancestral burial ground. <laughs> 
So that's one thing, but that's not on camera. Nobody can see it. It's, you know, it's whoever attends and, and hopefully they hear our voice and, and our call to action and um, make the right decisions. But in this case, we actually um, can document our voices. And this, in this case, you know, we, we talked about before this event about making this video. So we made this video, put it on YouTube. It's not yet public after this um, session, it'll be public. And it's interesting because when I check the boxes to try and figure out, okay, who can see this? Children can see this. They will be able to see this. And hopefully they ask questions or mothers will ask questions. And I would say, you know, if we talk to our children, our own children, and teach them to respect, to be respectful and teach them to think about history so that they do it for themselves, then we'll be in a better place. I also taught, taught ethnic studies um, for a number of years and people, my ethnic studies classes are not easy <laughs> and the, they would end up with people asking, what do I do? What do I do? I'm so sorry. Well, you don't have to be sorry to me, <laughs> but what can you do? You can teach your children to explore for themselves and look for the truth themselves. And if they look for the truth, then hopefully some of these um, dark places in our history books will be um, lightened. Um, they'll be, the truths will be disclosed and that would be helpful. I would say the other thing is just really think about how you walk on the earth um, walk gently and carefully and considerately and think about who was there before. We're, we um, built a relationship with a law firm and a nonprofit just recently, just within the last um, probably couple months. And now we actually have a place where we can, where people can donate money and the money all goes to legal fees so that we can protect um, sacred sites so that hopefully the next time there's a you know, an uncovering of a burial place, we can stop that or at least mitigate whatever's happening there. But now we actually have, you know, a law firm willing to help us as long as we can raise some money to cover those, some of those fees. Justina, would you like to add, you're a mother yourself. And I know um, from the previous program that we did that, you know, seven generations hold a lot of meaning um, I mean, you can, you know, would love for you to kind of touch, uh, touch about that a bit. Um, so, yeah, I talk about that a lot. Um, so when I was younger, my mom would take me to ceremony and, and, and I was young and, and, you know, I had friends and I didn't really want to be there. I knew it was the right thing. Um, so she took me to sweat and she took me to ceremony and she would always say, you know, this is for the seven, for seven generations. This is for people before you and people, the people, um, after you brought this for you. Right. And so, um, I would listen and participate. And then, um, when COVID hit, um, you know, it kind of just put, um, my family in a, in a hard mental place, you know, we can't go anywhere, we can't participate. And, um, and I had to bring those teachings and bring um, the calmness in my house. And that's where it hit me. I even called my mom and I was like, mom, I get it. Like, I get it. What you were doing for me when I was younger, it's my turn to bring to my daughters and my sons and my brothers and my sisters. Um, and so I'm doing that now still. Um, but if I didn't have that history and I didn't have those teachings, um, we would be lost. Yes. Yes. And, you know, that's part of the reason we want to have more programs like this, because we want to feel connected to history, not as a way of, you know, there is anger, yes, but there is also a way forward. And this beautiful mother-daughter story that you've shared and what you do every day for your own children, you know, is, is a true, true inspiration. And I thanks, thank you both for being a part of our uh, program tonight. Thank you. Yes. Um, and so from, you know, this whole tradition of passing, passing on the traditions, passing on culture, passing on family values, how do you then do that? to a whole city of uh, youth, 
right? And to talk about that is uh, Latoya Fernandez. Uh, Latoya, you know, I initially thought, how am I going to introduce you? And then I said, you know what, it's simple. I'm just going to let you talk about your journey. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I'm I just hearing this story, uh, number one, as a mother, um, as an educator and as a youth champion, I was very moved, very touched. I, I feel very strongly about how we use our experiences and we pass down our wisdom um, and we share these truths, but also match it with the empowerment piece of letting our youth feel like, hey, like, I got your back. I'm going to hold your hand through this. Not only am I going to educate you and tell you these truths, but I'm going to stand with you and help you take action to make things better. Um, and so, you know, my experience comes from education. I've been a teacher. I also served as an administrator, as a dean of students. And about six years ago, I started my own community-based youth empowerment organization. When I realized um, particularly that youth of color lacked a lot of confidence in the classroom. They were afraid to ask questions. They didn't want to be called upon. And when I would talk to them about what was going on, it was interesting to hear them say like, I don't picture myself going to college. I don't think it's possible for me to own my own business. I don't, I don't think I can get out of my situation. And I was like, wow, like I'm thinking this is like not the fifties. Like I don't understand what's going on, but I think our youth, they really hadn't seen themselves reflected in success and empowerment. What's been happening, and especially in our education system, is that they've been being taught about themselves and their ancestors from the lens of oppression. And so I love just how Charlene was sharing the cultural elements that like, this is not a story of struggle and sadness and despair. This is a story of your ancestors who had empires, who have cultures, who have who have routines that they follow that keep us powerful. And so when I realized as a teacher that it was my duty to teach students the truth about who they were, that's when I stepped in my power. And what I saw as a result of that was students be performing um, at a high academic level. Actually, in my first year of teaching, I broke a teaching record and my students grew over two years in reading in one year. And that was because I taught them the truth. I told them who their ancestors were and I showed them real examples of themselves, um, you know, reflected. So I think that's really important. And I also believe that our youth need champions. They are the most ignored population of people. Everybody's always making decisions about our youth and not including them in those decisions. And I think that's a problem. If we're talking about reimagining a world where our future leaders understand what's going on and feel they have the power to make necessary changes, we have to start giving them that platform right now, asking them right now, what is it that you want to see? How can we make this world better, this city better, this county better? And not just listening to what they have to say, but bringing them to the table and helping and, and having them help us in the strategic planning of, of making new policies and making new systems that work for everyone and that are inclusive of everyone. And so before I share some of my music, I want to say um, our youth know what's up and they're not racist. They're not sexist. They're not homophobic. They don't, they don't have anything against any, anyone's religion. They're actually looking at us as adults and they're like, get it together. You guys are making it hard for us. You're making it difficult for us. We don't care about this stuff. We just want everyone to be all right. They're empaths. So we need to, we need to start talking less and start listening to them and pushing their ideas forward. So I'm going to go ahead and share a video um, that I released. It's called Black Lives Matter. Um, and I actually released this video before the Black Lives Matter movement um, got big and the George Floyd protest broke out. Uh, but this was a, an expression to me because I had a lot of um, friends asking, like, why do black people have to say their lives matter? Like, what, what is that all about? I had students asking, like, what does this, this big movement mean? So I wrote this song, Black Lives Matter, to give, uh, to give an answer to that. This is why we're saying it. This is why it matters. And no one wants to have to say their life matters, right? So I'm going to go ahead and share that video, and then I'm going to perform something a cappella for y'all. OK. So let me go to my share screen. Hey, 
just know that life is becoming increasingly miserable for everybody. Apologies, y'all. I actually want to um, make sure that um, the speaker is on. It turned off while we were here getting busy. All right, here we go. We just know that life is becoming increasingly miserable for everybody. But when they find out who it is that's causing the trouble and who it is that's uh, making life miserable, when they get tuned into that, then they're all going to be just like the Panthers. America, why are you so pissed at me? Is it that my history eliminates the mystery? You deem me powerless, I'm undefeated, powerless. Resiliency is prowess, ascended below this flower. Told you you couldn't kill me, desperate to play the part. Not destined to be my equal, no matches to light the dark. Finish and now just started was happy to break the trauma. Ended up breeding artists, you're hating the stretch marks. I'm embracing these poor stars, people of fast cars. My people with slow starts refuse to play small parts. My people topping charts, delivering raw art. Generation with freedom is at heart, at heart. When freedom is at heart, no stopping it when it's hard. When freedom is at heart, community side Black Lives Matter. You're mad that we said it, we're mad that we had it. The underground railroad took strategy. Who here yet had to be could only come naturally. The Morris colonized Europe, display apathy, stole the perfect blueprint, splash paint catastrophe, disarm empathy relics. Reverse psychology, blowing up shooting stars that brought you astrology. Despite the mission of total black execution, we show up to the table with peace as the solution. Embracing these world stars, people with fast cars. My people with slow starts refuse to play small parts. My people topping charts, delivering raw art. Can't oppress a generation with freedom is at heart. At heart. With freedom is at heart. No stopping the winning start. With freedom is at heart. Community shatter. Black lives matter. Be mad that we said it. We're mad that we said it. Yes. Thank you all. So again, just like sharing that and saying like, number one, and this is a message to our youth, you can't oppress a generation when freedom is at heart. When you are liberated in here, no one can hold you down. No one can hold you back. So I'm actually going to go ahead and perform an acapella piece that I wrote specifically for my students. Um, I'm going to perform an acapella for you. Sitting on my throne, something to call my own. I gripped the microphone, accomplished on my own, but I wasn't alone. The skills becoming honed, the bay becomes my home. The woman finally grown, fear no longer drives me. I've gained self-control, tears no longer drown me, even evolve my tone. It's in the atmosphere, reality is clear. And as I lift the weight, my smile is finally real. Thought I wanted the deal, so I went for the kill. Rotating on that well, raindrops on a windowsill. All the money in the world can never take the place of a child in the hood with a smile on their face because they went to school they had holes in their shoes oatmeal cookies for lunch success far out of view but those students grew up they never made the news they became the teachers who believed in you no excuses the background seeming poor they closed the door el salvador the system doubts your potential families hunger for more they call you ell i'll call you language genius they call you underprivileged i'll call you hope that's gleaming so even if society keeps their standard low Still walk across that stage so much for what you didn't know. We're breaking barriers. The world was yours and mine from jump. So there's no way we'll ever give it up to Donald Trump. Those bodies in the dump. Those Asian girls were trafficked. Unsolved police crimes meets kidnapping. They blame the little girl. They say she pays the price because her exotic slanted eyes are just so enticing. She battles with her esteem. No one's wronging their rights. She thinks her beauty's only skin deep and cries at night. Strong queen, stand up. We must be the light. Strong king, stand up. Teach us how to fight. The thieves come at night. The thieves come at night. So we actually need the youth to fight. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Natalia. <laughs> That was fantastic performance. And um, what is beautiful is that you had action-packed poetry, right? You use the arts to kind of put your message forward and to create a path forward. I have one question for you before, I, before we welcome the, the, uh, the, the third artist. Um, how do you combat second guessing yourself or, or uh, combat you know, uh, self-doubt? or thinking that you are not 
you know, not you are who others perceive you to be, right? How do you get how how what how how would you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great question because confidence is a struggle, especially as a woman, being a woman of color, you know, um, it, it's one of those things where I've had to accept a couple of things about myself. One, that there were no mistakes in my creation, that I was actually created the way that I am as I am to fit into who I am supposed to be for this world. And that's why it's so important to understand our history and have and have that awareness of who our ancestors are. Because once I learned that my ancestors were these strong African people who are kings and queens, I was like, wait, that's in my bloodline? So I don't ever need to feel like I'm less than. And then the other thing is understanding and distinguishing between positive self-talk and negative self-talk. I used to say things to myself like, hey, I'm powerful, but I have kinky hair. I'm powerful, but I'm black. I feel uncomfortable about that. I'm powerful, but, and then I had to switch that language and change the word, but to because and accept those things as things that make me unique and beautiful. So now it's I'm powerful because my hair is kinky. I'm powerful because I'm black. I'm powerful because I'm a woman. There is a huge difference between how we feel about ourselves when we speak positivity and life to ourselves than when we speak de defeat to ourselves. So even just switching one word, but to because makes all of the difference. Oh, fantastic. I love that power of the one word, <laughs> Latoya. Thanks so much. And uh, now we welcome uh, Shika Malavia. And, you know, it's, I love this segue into uh, your segment, Shika, because, you know, Latoya talks about how, um, you know, you have to kind of see yourself in a different image. And you actually are going to personify a woman from the late 1800s who defied custom, defied tradition, defied uh, the definitions that were, uh, you know, her lot in life and actually made the journey from India to the US. And I'm going to bring up that powerful visual, uh, but I'm going to have you uh, start, you know, uh, talk about your own journey about why, uh, you know, why you decided to do this. Oh, right. Um... I just want to say I knew this conversation that we're all having today was going to be powerful, but this is something else altogether. And, um, you know, I think all of us have are, are basically through the work we're doing and also through what Mosaic is doing, you know, as you said, we are all asking, how do we connect people to history? And I want to extend that to saying, how do we connect to history? And I think education begins from the South. And it is a search for identity. And even in my case, because, um, you know, my parents moved here in the 70s and many of us South Asians have that same narrative that the story begins with when my parents moved here. But that is not the case. There were there were Indians that came here. I mean, the South Asians or Indians that came here um, way before our parents, way before all the doctors and engineers, um, even before the Sikh farmers that settled in Central California. And so as a South Asian, as an Indian, trying to grapple with my identity, because growing up, I went through a lot of racism, and I always identified more with being Indian and less with being an, an American. And I, I really wanted to know what my roots were, because, you know, did my roots just begin in 1971 then. So um, I was doing a search um, on the net, internet on South Asian history. And um, I wondered who was the first woman who came here to the United States from India. And that question inadvertently led me here to this image. Um, and um, I, I wanna say that this image, you know, it, it is, an exotic image, right? You have um, in, an Indian woman in a sari, you have a Japanese woman in her kimono, and then you have a Syrian woman here um, in all of her finery. And um, I, I, I was still, even though this picture might be disturbing in some ways or ex exoticized in some ways, I was just riveted, right? Um, and um, I wanted to know who was this woman? You know, where did she come from? why did she have this defiant determined look? And so um, I found out that her name is Anandi Gopal Joshi. 
and that she was the first Indian woman to come to the United States to study medicine. And she was India's first medical doctor who was a woman. And, and I was just blown away. Why hadn't I ever heard of her before? I mean, this is part of our history, but I didn't read it in any book. And I just found out about this four years ago. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost 50. So I'm like, this is amazing. And I wanted to know more. So I started digging deeper and deeper. And um, her, her story is such an amazing one, because as you'd mentioned before, she had to go through so many hurdles in order to even cross what they called Kalapani or black waters, because they considered in um, Hinduism and in India at the time, uh, crossing the ocean to be taboo. So I would like to invite all of you to journey into the life of Anandi Gopal Joshi tonight through poems imagined in her own voice. And there's a reason why I decided to do persona poetry. And that's because whenever her story was told in India, it was always told through the lens of her husband who, who um, encouraged her to learn and um, in often violent ways. So I feel like her voice was suppressed in the story itself. And so I decided that I would attempt to write her story in ho her own voice and give her agency back to her. So anyway, I'd love to share um, some poems with you. And if we could get to the next slide, then I can... Um, uh, before hold, hold yeah. your passion yeah. I do have one <laughs> announcement to make uh, uh, to to my dear audience if please hang back with us because after uh, Shikha is done performing her poetry we are going to get all of the artists and culture bearers back uh, and you are you're free to ask us uh, send in your, your send us your questions in through the zoom chat the YouTube uh, chat as well as the Facebook chat uh, we are welcome, uh, you know, we are welcoming of any and all questions. We will also have uh, Robin back from the museum. Um, so there's going to be San Jose Museum of Art, Mosaic America, Shikama Olivia, Latoya Fernandez, Shalene Vasquez, and Justina Paula Fox on the panel and open for you to ask questions too. And without much ado, more ado, I'm going to stop my video and then Shika, yeah. I'm going to switch to the next picture. Sure. Um, okay. So, um, okay. So the first poem I'll be reading is called Outside the Chaukat. And Chaukat means doorframe in Marathi. And here it represents the clear division between an Indian woman's world inside the home versus a man's world outside of it. Anandi Gopal Joshi, which people also refer to as Anandi Bai, was born in Kalyan, Maharashtra on March 31st, 1865, in a busy port town that is now a suburb of present day Mumbai. It was a time when Indian society held on to their traditions and customs very fiercely in retaliation of British colonial rule and Western influence. So outside the Chaukat. If you want to know what happens in this bustling town by the sea, Kalyan, which in Sanskrit means well-being, but whose shores have thrice been plundered by the Mughals, the Portuguese and the British, despite the shade of a fortress and a long city wall with four gates and 11 towers, whose welfare is erased and renamed Kalyan and Kalyan. Ask the men, for they are the ones who wear shoes that take them outside the Jaukat. They are the lucky ones who, donning their turbans, smell the dung of many homes, hear the hum of horses' hooves, darken their hands with the ink of newsprint, read the cover of the day while sitting on a zopara in the courtyard dragging a puff from a gurgling hookah. Whereas the women tiptoe softly, their bare soles hardened, walking from kitchen to cow shed to well, fingertips charge, charge, charred, sorry, from stoking the chulha, thoughts spilling over like water, from vessels balanced on their heads, of what lies beyond a door frame that make a splash and then evaporate. So um, the next poem I'm, I'll be reading, and I think we have an image with that as well. <clears throat> yes, um, on the left is a picture of Anandi Bai as a student. And I think this was taken the first year when she had enrolled into medical college. And then next to that is a language primer, um, the kind that she might have read and learned English from. So 
at the ripe old age of nine, Anandibai was married to Gopal Rao Joshi, a widower who was 16 years older than her. Gopal Rao was an overzealously progressive man and was instrumental in encouraging Anandibai to pursue an education, but he often resorted to extreme behavior to get her to study. Um, despite the protest of Anandibai's family, who felt a woman's place was tending to her own family and not going to school, Gopal Rao emphasized learning English so that Anandi could pursue her dream of becoming a doctor, which sadly arose from the loss of her son, which she gave birth to at the young age of 14. Due to lack of access to medical care and the reluctance of Indian women to see male doctors who were often European, Anandi Bai lost her son when he was only 10 days old. Anandi learns English. This new language is like balancing a marble on my tongue. The K in knife, silent. The T in brother, soft. Ajji says, why learn the bhasha of the angres who don't bathe every day, who eat the flesh of animals like a jungly and call us heathen instead with our heads covered and our feet bare. But my husband, he brings me books in aval angrezi. He says, I must learn it all their language, their God, their modern ways, anything to help us cross Kalapani, to hold their alphabets in my mouth and swallow before they roll away. All right, and so the next poem I'm gonna read, and we have an image for that as well, um, is a picture of Anandibai's husband's letter, which he wrote. Um, to some missionaries asking them to try and help his wife. And then there's the ship which Anandibai sailed on. So um, she does eventually um, get to cross Kalapani. So call it fate or serendipity, but Anandibai's husband wrote a letter which was published in a journal called the Princeton Missionary Review. And it reached an American woman in New Jersey while she was in the dentist's waiting room. Um, Anandibai's desire to become a doctor and help the women of her land resonated loudly with Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter of Rosell, New Jersey. And she wrote back to Anandibai immediately offering her friendship and support. Anandibai and Theodosia exchanged letters for three years before she set sail on the city of Calcutta steamship for the US in 1883. Mrs. Carpenter, whom Anandi came to regard as a second mother was waiting with her husband to receive her and give her a home as she pursued her medical studies. Riding the Meridian. Countless creases on these waters of ships traversing the ocean's face as the sun plays truant during our voyage. Mrs. X, my companion, draws notches in the back pages of her Bible, of days and nights feigning prayer while eyeing my movements, wondering what is it this Hindu is reading, remarking how no book is as worthy as the black bound one in her hands. Other passengers look at me unfavorably as I push bald potatoes and lymph vegetables around my plate, holding a fork and knife gingerly, refusing animal flesh. I ignore their whispers of how I should be in third class with the ayahs. And yet I wish it were so, for I would find less pretense there and more color in conversation, no threats of conversion. But in each lip of land our ship touches, I take delight, a different scene as if from a storybook, Ceylon's tall palms swaying, Egyptian soil gleaming red, and England's cottony clouds like an umbrella over our heads. With the sun's daily revolutions, we move further and further from the equator at the speed of four to six knots, my sari rippling and salty air as I inhale the scent of a new world. The seas, neither black nor poisonous, but taking shape of the palm that holds it. How does that which has no color both bless and stain, all of us water? And I think of Copernicus who stood by his convictions who knew the true meaning of circumambulation, how it is us that revolves around what gives us sustenance and not the other way around. So the next poem um, will take us to Philadelphia where Anandibai has arrived. 
Anand Levi was admitted to the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in the fall of 1883 and applauded for her courage in defying tradition and religion to get there. She impressed everyone with her confidence and mastery of English. In fact, um, I read that she, had, she, she was speaking English so much that she had forgotten how to speak Marathi. <laughs> and I think that's so amazing that she had that kind of focus. So, um, but she maintained her culture and customs. She always wore saris everywhere. She modified them a little bit, but she always wore her Indian clothes. So above all, it was Anandibai's determination to help her countrywoman that moved everyone she met. They call me Lady of the Orient. And this poem is based on a reception that was held for her to welcome her. Though the darkest one in the room, I'm the brightest of them all in a red pitambar sari deemed Pompeian bell of this ball. And as I shake their hands, 500 pairs wearing gloves to protect me. They regard the spray of pearls hanging from my nose, my filigreed wrists of bangles glinting gold, the tiny kunku dot on my broad forehead drawing stares and praise for this young Brahmin lady so brave, having come all the way alone from Serampur to the city of brotherly love to earn her doctor's coat. I want to say in my native tongue, so that I don't forget who I am, the young girl whose books once lay tattered in the cow shed, whose baby lived barely 10 days. I float like an Indian rose among the dull sea of cinched waists and bonnets in the parlor of the Dean of the Women's Medical College, smiling till my cheeks hurt as they stumble out a new version of my name, Ananda Bai, remarking how exquisite is my English. And um, the next poem after that, um, and to me, this is really incredible. I, and I think we have a slide for that as well. Is that imagine in 1883, in the town of Russell, New Jersey, Anandi Bai cooked a traditional Marathi meal of 18 dishes in the home of her host. Uh, she was so thrilled with the warmth and kindness that she was received with that she wanted to do something to return the hospitality. And so she decided to cook this feast. So um, it was held in the home of Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter, her host, and um, friends were invited and they all sat Indian style cross-legged and the women even had borrowed, um, or rather Anand Levi had lent them um, her saris and her jewelry for that special night. So I written this poem in um, ghazal form and it's called When the Guests Sup as Gods. In my wildest dreams, never do I fathom tonight that I should turn them into feasting Indians tonight, not those whose vast plains they call their own, but proud Marathas from my faraway native tonight. All the fair ladies draped in woven bordered saris, hands spangled, necks spangled, shining bright tonight as they swish across the inlaid floor like princesses in my colorful trousseau that belongs to them tonight. 18 squares hand-drawn in red and white powder on the dining room floor where guests supped as gods tonight, set with plates stitched from broad buttonwood leaves, a rich meal of spiced vegetables and fruit await all tonight. After a Sanskrit prayer blessing this feast is chanted, all eyes look up to me on how to proceed tonight. No spoons, no forks, nor knives, just their pear ill bare hands, sampling 18 exotic dishes prepared by myself tonight, fashioning small balls out of their food with pink fingertips. They pop them into their mouths like all of India does tonight. The meal ends with a serenade and sprinkling of rose water, bouquets of freshly plucked flowers given to each guest tonight. Oh, Anandi, see the red kunku on all their white foreheads how the love of my new sisters makes this heart swell tonight. Um, how are we doing on time, Priya? <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm not, you know. Uh, we have about three minutes. Okay, cool. So I think um, the next few poems give a glimpse into Anandibai's life in the United States as a student and as a visitor. 
uh, Anandi Bai was constantly falling sick, and yet she approached life in America with wonder, curiosity, and gratitude. And she was unaware that she had tuberculosis. Despite her poor health, Anandi Bai managed to travel the East Coast and meet many people, ebony, ivory, and silk. Over my doctor's white coat and the black beaded Mangal Sutra that lay snugly against my chest as proof of marriage. Tips of ivory in each ear connected by tubes wrapped in fine silk, forming a parabola, a conduit of sound from which hangs an ebony medallion confirming proof of life through the steady gallop of beating heart and burbling lungs. And I wonder how this is not considered a type of precious jewelry as well, the stethoscope worn by a rare few of my sex. And the next poem was when Anandi Bai traveled to um, the northern part of New York, to the countryside. A visit to the springs. I will not let my pain interfere with anybody's happiness, not even my own. My body, still used to the tropics, unable to adjust aches with every movement. And this headache, which is my constant companion, I ignore as we, as we make our way through the countryside. In Troy, I try cucumber pickles that are unusually green. No one can tell me why, and I suspect they have copper in them. When I run a needle through a pickle, it turns bright red, and only then am I satisfied. Someone remarks how that is my doctor's mind. In Saratoga, the women roam freely without their bonnets and their hair like fine silk flutters in the summer breeze as they visit the springs. I find out this is the land of the Iroquois tribe. I meet a squaw and we exchange notes on how different our Indianness is. As we part, she gives me a necklace of beads and calls me sister. I give her a copper one-fourth Anna coin with Empress Victoria on one side. And um, this next poem is, um, I, I really enjoyed writing it. And uh, while researching, uh, I found out that um, crazy quilting or what we call patchwork quilting um, was very much in fashion at the time. And all these women that Anandi met would gift her these small pieces of cloth and Anandi was so excited about that and she pieced together this quilt which you can see here and in the image and she was really really intent on finishing it before leaving the United States and in the center of it um, she's written her husband's name Gopal Joshi. It's crazy quilt work. Resourcefulness knows no nationality among women tending the hearth. We are mistresses of improvisation, magicians of the ordinary. These fabric scraps whose warp and weft seem exhausted, we collect like, like leaves till they are plenty, a motley come together haphazardly. No symmetry, no intentional design, just hardworking fingers patching together what seems out of order. This crazy work, an American pastime, becomes this Maratha woman's way to pass a summer filled with anticipation and premonition. So much to be done, so little time to do it, these gifted blocks of cloth, beating bright with love and generosity, become a quilt that covers my unseasonal chills, my malaise for which no cure fits. So um, the next slide which we have, and um, there are no more poems, that was the last poem, um, when I found this out, this really blew my mind. So um, Anandi Bai graduated from medical school within three years at the age of 21 and returned to India in 1886. While she was criticized in Malign for wanting to leave India to pursue an education, on returning with her medical degree, she was celebrated and hailed as an example for other Indian women. Anandi Bai was supposed to serve as the physician in charge of the female ward of Albert Edward Hospital in Kolhapur, but she passed away from tuberculosis on February 26, 1887, and so she was not able to serve as a doctor. 
After being cremated, as per her wish, her husband sent her ashes to Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter in New Jersey, and um, they're interred in Poughkeepsie, New York with the Carpenter family. Her gravestone reads, Anandabai, and it's interesting that her name is misspelled here, Anandabai, first Brahmin woman to leave India and obtain an education. So I hope I was able to convey a little bit of Anandibai's story here through these poems. And um, it, it's- Yes. It, I, I mean, it, one could certainly see the connection that you have with her, for sure, for sure. <laughs> hey, I have an immediate question. And at yeah. this point, I would like the all of the all of our panelists to come back on camera. And I encourage the audience to send us questions via chat on the Zoom and chat on the YouTube and Facebook channels that this is streaming out to. Uh, Shikha, a question for you. The, yes. you know, the last slide had the word Brahmin, hmm. right? And I was struck by that because that is a, you know, a way of life, community, caste, however you want to describe it, but in India, right. and made, making sense more to Indians, why was it on her tombstone? Was it a widely understood term? So, um, you know, it, it, it's 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 very interesting. I'm really glad you asked that question because this is also something I kept on coming across in several news articles. And um, here, uh, I mean, and especially now when there's you know the the Dalit uh, movement and things like that, um, Anandibai did come from privilege. I, and at that time, I don't know if she knew exactly what it meant because even if you were a Brahmin woman. You, you were supposed to remain at home. You were supposed to um, you know, just take care of your children and your family. But because of the missionaries that had come into India and um, you know, they familiarized themselves with Hinduism and they familiarized themselves with the caste system, they also you know, um, brought that back with them when they came to the United States. And and also um, theosophy was really big and this fascination with occultism at the time that it seems that, you know, people here in the United States were fascinated with the fact that Anandibai was also a Brahmin, right? And um, in every news article that came in the papers, they, they kept on mentioning how she was a Brahmin woman. Mm. And um, while they celebrated that, I, whenever I would read about how Anandibai responded to it, I don't think she really thought that way. And the and I think the proof of that is that being a Hindu, she first of all decided to cross waters which were considered taboo. She lived here alone. And after she passed away, she asked for her ashes to be buried in, in a cemetery among Christian people. So it's really interesting that how she was celebrated as being a Brahmin woman, but I don't think at all that she looked at herself like that. Mm. How interesting. And what I like about, uh, you know, I asked myself, you know, do we, you know, why should we include Anandibai as what as the, you know, as a voice in this program? And uh, obviously, she, you know, her voice definitely um, needs to be heard. But what I loved about it is that, you know, it, it shows us how America can be a nurturing place, also, right? Um, and, and it kind of reminded me of, you know, 20 years ago when I first made my journey to the U.S., right? The promise, ambition, uh, safe harbor, uh, you know, home and belonging, right? I mean, at the end of the day, that's all we want. We want to belong, right? And for so yeah. many of us, for so many years, this land, belonging has been elusive, Right. And so that's why I wanted to kind of bring that connection uh, in, because that is she needed to come into her own as a doctor and that doctorate and the medical studies, America offered it to her. Right. So for, for me, that was like the most uh, profound, uh, apart from her own journey, that was a profound aspect and why we thought right. that, you know, this absolutely has to be part of Mosaic America's artist lineup, you know, Anandi by herself in first person, like you have presented her. And it's not just her becoming a doctor. I don't think she knew who she was or, or, or that she was allowed to be herself 
until she came to this country because she was constantly being told by her husband what she needed to do. And she was constantly, constantly being told by her other family members what she shouldn't be doing. And once she came here, people wanted to know who she was, what her favorite color was, what her favorite names were. You know, there. In fact, Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter had this um, autograph book where she asked all these questions, like, "What is your favorite place on earth?" Things like that. And she wrote her favorite place on earth was Rosal, New Jersey. <laughs> you know, and that's saying something. You know, it is saying something. Yeah, it, it, it's it's so so fascinating to me. And yet she came on her own terms. She didn't want to convert to Christianity because if she had, she would have probably arrived in the United States much sooner. But she stood her ground, but she thought all religions were equal and she just wanted to be herself. And for whatever reason, I mean, all the circumstances brought together by being in the United States, she was able to be herself because she didn't have anybody else telling her who she should be. Yeah, and see, that kind of brings it full circle, right? All the stories we've heard on this panel today, this one kind of is is like the complement of the other stories, right? And Latoya is kind of like the bridge between uh, how do you enable that? And on that topic, uh, question for Latoya. As someone engaged in social justice work, how do you keep from getting depleted and down? Where do you draw your strength from? Yeah, good question. Um, I actually see self-care as a part of social justice. It's a part of the revolution. So there can be no revolution without self-care. A lesson that I had to learn, um, I didn't learn in my 20s. I was burnt out in my 20s. Um, and I had a lot of really unhealthy habits and I was very unhealthy in mind, body and spirit. Um, and when I came to understand that I could not pour into anyone's well if mine was dry um, mm -hmm. and, and that I didn't have to feel guilt or shame about taking steps back, um, I felt empowered by that. So taking naps is a part of my day. I take a nap every day. Um, I, I get massages, I get my toes done, I get my fingernails done. Um, and when I just want to take a minute to not do anything, I take a minute to not do anything. And I don't feel the need to explain myself to anyone because as women, we're such givers. We give to everyone all the time. So we actually don't owe anyone an explanation when we want to take time for ourselves. And so I stand by that and I stand in that and I get my strength from that and knowing that like, I have the right to take my space. Mm -hmm. I know we are over time, but there is I, I would love to uh, kind of have you guys here for a few more questions. Um, actually, Justina and Charlene, uh, can you also talk to, uh, you know, how to not be f feeling overwhelmed by sometimes, right? There is a generational, uh, I want to say cross you bear or burden, right? That you feel like you have to, you know, you, you cannot even take, uh, like Latoya says, take a few minutes to yourself because, oh my God, you know, my ancestors suffered so much and I have to give so much to my future generations, right? How do you deal with that on a daily basis? Uh, Justina, you as a newer mother than Charlene? Um, you know what, it's, um, you kind of just know it's your place. You put one foot in front of the other and you just keep going. Um, I think Latoya brought up a, a very important um, point is you do have to take time for yourself and you have to make sure your mental health is um, on a positive note and you just keep going and, and you kind of don't have a choice. You have to stand up for your people and you have to keep the stories going. Um, it, it was just something that, that I was brought up with. So I, you, in my perspective, in my um, opinion, I don't have a choice but to keep going. I don't have a choice but to keep telling my stories so that it doesn't get lost. Charlene? Also, there's a follow-up for you, Charlene. Uh, the appointment of Deb Holland as our Native American, uh, as our first Native American woman as Interior Sec Sec Secretary uh, is tremendous. Could you kind of answer the both questions? I mean, just comment on both. Sure. So having a Native American woman as a Secretary of Interior is just super amazing. And I think partly is because um, 
So you think about something like if anybody followed all the events around Standing Rock, she actually was there. So it, it, she's not just a person and just a Native American person, but she's there on the front lines and understands exactly what's happening. So that's super important. Uh, the other part is that by being a witness to all of that, then we trust that she'll relay the messages that need to be um, shared appropriately and truthfully and honestly and um, collaborate to come up with some good solutions. So that's number one. So that's super exciting. And then in terms of um, keeping your power, <laughs> this is a long, uh, a, a, a long talk, but it's really about paying attention paying attention to everything around you. So Justina's right about being centered and, and taking care of your own health. But the other part is just paying attention to everything around you. And here's one little short story. And people know me, I can tell lots of stories. I was in my 20s. And when late 20s, when I went back to college or went to college, I, I went from high school to work um, right away to help my mom. And then in my 20, late 20s, I went to college. And I'm sitting in my first class. I'm there, you know, maybe just a few sessions in, and there was a gentleman next to me, and he was clearly 30 to 40 years, 40 years older than me, much older. And I'm sitting there, and I'm ready to go. I'd been wanting to go to college since I was five, and he asked me a question, and I don't exactly remember my response. And he looked at me, and he said, "You're so optimistic. How do you keep hope?" Mm. And I said, "How can I not be hopeful?" And I've always thought about that. And every time I forget, some person comes into my life and says, Charlene, what about this? And I'll give some apparently optimistic point of view. <laughs> and I think while the walls are crashing all, all around you, sometimes it appears it's that ability to see the next generation and keep that in your mind. But again, of course, you know, just constantly also watching your health um, is super important. Taking breaks is super important. When people know that you're a hard worker and you say, guess what, my phone's gonna be off for this weekend. They respect that because they know that you're always available. So that's kind of important. And I totally appreciate the circle of people around me. I'm so glad this is getting recorded. So anytime I'm going to feel down, I'm just going to play this. Um, we have a observation by Sherry. And she says, in my Jewish upbringing, we were taught about predecessors who, became, who, who become successful and or contributed to society and had forged a path for others. Is that also part of Indian youth's education to know about your own people? Or was it or was it because Anandi Bai was a woman and you hadn't learned about her? I guess, uh, Shika, she's kind of asking about. Right. Yeah. You know, this is a very interesting question, which I have been mulling over. And that's why I feel so strongly about women's narratives. Um, so Anandi Bai's story was um, turned into a play in, in um, a Marathi play in, in the region where she comes from, Maharashtra. Um, there, there are quite a few people who know or knew who she was growing up, but um, in the rest of India, not so much. Um, and I think it's because, I, I think you have a point. <laughs> I think a lot of times women's stories are sidelined. They, they might be celebrated in a play or they might be celebrated, um, there, there are biographies. I think there were one or two biographies of hers that were written, a novel and a biography, in fact, that were written in the early 1900s. But um, no, voices are often sidelined. And um, I think because we had such a contentious history with the British and there was so much nation building and the freedom fighting that there are a few people who actually get more credit or who, who we focus on rather than the women who um, you know, forged different paths and you know, were able to bring change. And, I think that's why it's so important to excavate these stories and bring them out into the open. And I've seen that happen in the past 10 years. So I'm really excited. I'm really excited to see what it brings. But I think you'll find that in history around the world, how it's very exclusionary to women's stories. And I think it's up to all of us artists to change that. You know? 
Yes, and uh, Robin, <laughs> you're it now. <laughs> uh, so speaking to all of our, you know, all of what was shared today, and especially to Shikha's last point about how, um, you know, some stories need to be told, right? And I know the, you, the San Jose Museum of Art does a great job in in highlighting some of that work, right? So, but I'd like you to comment on this one uh, observation by Prakriti. And she says, as immigrants, and I'm assuming as minorities as well, in the interest of assimilating ourselves, we tend to disintegrate ourselves. Energies are put into fitting in instead of belonging. So how do we be conscious and convicted to holding on to who we are? and why I want to put you on the spot with this one is because, you know, the museum is also a place that unearths a lot of identities, right? And stories. And so how do you see the, a, a museum's place in building connections with community, place, people, history, future? <laughs> you are putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you can handle it. <laughs> You know, I'm, uh, I kind of have sort of two things in mind um, uh, to talk about to answer that. One is to say that the San Jose Museum of Art is a, a contemporary art museum. And the reason that that's an important distinction is because the work that we show is the work of our time. It is by us, about us, for us. It is who we are right now in this moment. So it both reflects that and sort of drives that conversation. Um, it doesn't, we're, we don't have that long view of history, academics and, and, and other important people haven't looked back and decided that it was good art or bad art. They haven't decided its value. We get to decide that for ourselves in the moment as we're looking at it. And that's a really precious gift, I feel, because um, speaking for myself, you know, museums were very important to me as a child, uh, partly because I grew up in a big family. I have a lot of brothers. <laughs> it was noisy. <laughs> museums were not home and they were quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and for whatever reason, whatever crazy reason, my parents were very willing to drop me off at 10 in the morning and come back and pick me up at five in the afternoon. <laughs> so <laughs> they were like a sanctuary for me. But every important thing I think I ever learned in life, I learned in a museum. Mm -hmm. And so it, they were, it, it, to me, it, it is a, it's another avenue to learning. It's another avenue to seeing yourself, to seeing other people to understanding other cultures. I can clearly remember as a child standing fascinated in front of a, of a, a history exhibition about the Aztecs um, and I was just transfixed. I can remember as a very small child standing in front of Picasso's Guernica and looking at that gigantic black and white mural about war and I will never forget it. So it, art has that power to move us, but the thing about contemporary art is it's about us, it's who we are, it's what we are, it's what we're thinking, it provokes conversations, but it also has that ability to validate them as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important. The other thing this kind of this whole conversation made me think of, and the reason that I wanted to do this and that I think it's really important is because I wanna tell you a little story of my own. Um, in 1895, a baby girl was born in a small town in Massachusetts. She was blonde and blue eyed and she was very sharp witted and musically gifted. When she graduated from high school it was expected that she would get married and start a family. But um, her sister came down with diphtheria. And so the other kids were sent away uh, to protect them. So she was sent to a music school in New York City and uh, to get an education because you know, they had to send her someplace. And the only other choice was California and that was too far away. So they sent her to New York. She went to music school. She met a man there who was kind of just a middle of the road, unimpressive vaudeville entertainer who had this act and he took it up and down the Eastern seaboard and he needed a, pian a pianist to accompany him. And so he invited her along and she went. 
And they went up and down the Eastern seaboard. And at one point they went to Cuba. And for 10 years, she traveled around, I was almost 10 years, she traveled around with this guy and, uh, and just went to all kinds of entertainment venues. And she had a life. When she turned 31, her family called her home and she went home, she met a man, she got married, she started a family. She lived the life she was expected to live. But for 10 years, she had a life of her own. She had a life that she chose, that was of her own making, her own design, that was sprang from her, from who she was and her talents. That woman was my grandmother. <laughs> and I never found this story out until I was almost, I was like 25, you know, I was an adult when I found this out. My grandmother never talked about it. And, uh, and so I asked her about it one time. She wouldn't tell me about it. So my brother and I went and looked up a bunch of stuff about her and this guy she lived with. And um, it was really interesting. But the thing about it is that story may not have mattered to her, but it mattered to me because I suddenly understood mm -hmm. that there was this woman who didn't, for a period of time had a life of her own and it made me feel like I could choose that too and it changed everything for me it was like the ground shifted under my feet and I suddenly was like oh this is my life mine mine I get to do what I want and so yeah. I did and if I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't heard that story because I didn't feel that sense of entitlement that Latoya is talking about, I didn't feel that. I didn't have anybody to give that to me. And so that's why I think these stories, whether, you know, and, and you know, she wasn't some fantastic pianist and neither was he. I guess he was just sort of a, you know, a funny vaudeville guy. They didn't win any prizes, but they chose something for themselves. And I think that's the really important part. And I think young women today need to know Mm -hmm. that they stand on very strong shoulders, that there is all this history. The fact that nobody ever told them doesn't mean it isn't there. And it does matter. And it is important. And these are our voices and our histories. And we get to own them. Absolutely. And you have beautifully concluded and summarized <laughs> the reason we are all here for this 75 minute program. <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> everybody. Um, we have, I mean, the chat is full of compliments to each and every one of you. And um, I'm hoping to download it and send it your way. Um, I, I, we are unable to take any more questions because we are reaching the 90 minute mark. Uh, but thank you again, Shika, Robin, Charlene, Justina. We, we lost LaToya to another obligation, but LaToya too. Thanks so much. And to all. the audience, to the audience, if you like what you uh, saw, please follow us, Mosaic America, uh, mosaicamerica.org. We are on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we're on Insta reach out to us, email us, info at um, We would love to have you in, in any capacity, uh, as an audience, as an artist, as a volunteer, as a team member, however. Again, thanks everybody. And I give you back your evening. Thank you so much, Priya, too. And thank you to all the panelists for being with us. It was an honor, really, to be among such great women. And I was so pleased that we had a mother-daughter team with us tonight. So thank you so much for being with us, everybody. And uh, we look forward to future collaborations with Mosaic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We're counting on it. Thank, <laughs> thank you. <for> you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Have a great Bye. evening.